Allen caps. I drive the Napa Auto Parts 10,000 horsepower Nitro Dodge Charger. Kind of conditions here. Well, you know, you get asked that a lot. What's what's ten thousand horsepower like? And you know. Other motorsports guys, the, the, the way that you can kind of describe it is you get a lot of guys that will drive anything and they'll jump in anything, myself included. I love jumping in sprint cars. Anything I can get my hands on it that's a race car, I love to drive. You get some of the best in a business that I offer to put in our car to, to go four seconds at 320 miles an hour and uh, a lot of them shake their head <laughs> and just say, I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, it, it It's insane, man. It's, uh, it's hard to explain to somebody because it's, there's so much going on. You, we go through more G-forces than anything on the planet except the fighter pilot. More than the space shuttle pilots, more than anything else. It's uh, almost six Gs positive going down the drag strip. It's zero to 320 miles per hour in a thousand feet from a standing stop. Zero to, to over 100 miles per hour in less than one second from a standing stop. Uh, so there's a lot going on. And it, it sort of, I have to kind of explain to people, it's sort of like that first science fiction movie you saw where they went into hyperspace and they had all the lines and, and and they said all right we're hitting hyperspace and that's what it's like as soon as we take off with the exception of the exact area that I'm looking down the track everything else is a complete blur and on top of that when I hit the parachutes it's almost a negative seven or eight G's so there's a lot going on in that short amount of time and on top you, you think at my right toe I've got 10,000 horsepower um, it's uh, it's an incredible feeling, but it happens very fast. So you have to be on top of everything to do with the car for that three and a half seconds. Our season's good. We uh, you know we we lost the heartbreaker in 2012, lost the championship by two points, and uh, it came down to myself and my teammate and we battled back and forth. And we have what's called the countdown to championship. And it's much like the chase in NASCAR or playoffs. And it's the last six races of the season, everything is reset in the top 10. They take the top 10, they reset them. So really going into it, if you're number 10, you still got a shot at a championship when they reset the points. And you battle it for six races. It's a six race shootout for a playoff. And the winner is declared the champion. So it's a little different than the old days when you battled all season long for a championship. And uh, you just gotta be good at the right time. You gotta be top 10 going into Indianapolis. And then you gotta be the best for that six races. And uh, last year we set the world's quickest run in history. And only the second run under four seconds, ran 3.96 seconds, English Town, New Jersey. Uh, this week in the conditions here, on Friday night could see those same type of conditions. So we're looking to maybe better that and there's a lot of other teams can as well. So season's good up to this point. I think we're fourth in the points now. Hopefully by the time this gets posted, we're uh, back up to number one, but we got a race car that can be number one at any time. And it's, it's a great team and uh, I'm very lucky and very blessed to have a team around me that can put together a car like, like our Dodge car. You know, coming to New Hampshire has been a long time coming. I, I, I don't, I've never been here. Only guys like John Forrest and some of the guys that have been out here for, for a while have match raced here a long time ago. It's a, it's a small track that after this weekend, I guarantee we'll be back and they'll, they'll have a bigger parking lot, bigger tower, bigger everything. Because this weekend, I can already tell that the traffic's out both sides. Uh, the grandstands had to be extended for uh, reserve seating which is all good. It's a great racetrack. The surface itself is uh, concrete. All The whole track is a concrete surface. So that is good for us, especially when the heat comes because the track may heat up, but if you have asphalt, as a lot of iRacing people know, the difference between getting on asphalt and concrete is huge. And the concrete will uphold the heat better. And when you're talking about 10,000 horsepower and trying to plant those Goodyear tires on the ground for four seconds and not lose traction, Concrete's important, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. I mean, it's, you know, I've raced 16 years. Um, 
and I've always read about New Hampshire and what it was like in the old days at New England Dragway, and I just never had a chance to come here. Reading about the snake and the mongoose and Jungle Jim and all the guys on the East Coast, uh, and being a kid from California, it's cool to finally be here. Yeah, the difference, you know, with our cars, especially compared to other motorsports, is uh, the unbelievable G-forces we get, positive and negative. Like I said before, it's it's upwards of six Gs during a run, and can be as high with two parachutes out as it can be as high as negative seven Gs, negative eight Gs. It puts a tremendous toll on your body, um, as do other motorsports. But ours happens such a short amount of time that. I just work on keeping my body in shape, especially my neck and my shoulder muscles. They go through a lot. Um, and your reaction times are probably the most important thing. That, as everybody knows growing up, you know, reading about drag racing, you have the Christmas tree with the lights coming down. The reaction time is probably the most important thing. So you try to stay on top of that. And you've got things that can test you. Uh, for me, I don't necessarily sit and do a, a reaction time tester. For me, I, I work on hand-eye coordination, and, and the best thing I have found is simulation racing. And I race, that's why I was so excited about when it came out, um, the chance to get in a Formula One car, which on a track that the car is moving around, there's no better tool to be able to work on your hand-eye coordination, listening to the car, feeling the car, having your hands do what they're supposed to do, split second. Um, so there's a lot of things that I try to work on, but mainly it's just hand-eye coordination and reaction times. My sim's not, it, it doesn't move, it's not extravagant. It's actually uh, a seat setup that I, I actually bought used off of a guy that, uh, that uh, lived up in Los Angeles. And we'd, we'd, you know, I'd been doing simulation back when they first came out of the IndyCar game. So when Dave, I knew, after uh, you know, after playing the Grand Prix Legends game, I mean that was the, the game of all games. Um, for me, an upgrade was a nice setup that was a nice seat with a nice steering wheel and as good a monitor as I could afford at the time. And uh, now you see these ones that move around and stuff, and that's that's not what I have at home. I've got a nice, simple setup, but it does the job for me, and uh, I can adjust my seat. And the best part is. I can adjust it so when people come over and we'll have a party at the house or people to visit or friends just come over, I mean, they gravitate right out into that thing and I'll put them on with a, maybe a cup car at a nice easy track. And then as they get more and more cocky, I'll move them into other vehicles. But for me, I, when I get an iRace, and one of my favorites is a Silver Crown car on a fast, high banked oval. I just love the twitchiness of the car and having to uh, feel the seat of your pants and, and feel the car and listen to the car. Um, and it's one of the most exciting. You find yourself holding your breath a lot of times, lap to lap, and sometimes going down the straight and going, breathe, breathe. And, uh, and that's probably what it's like in real person racing those cars, but uh, it's fun getting a bunch of guys together and getting on there or getting into a race. And uh, I'm more of an open wheel guy, so I love the open wheel stuff. Um, but it's a, it's a big part of my life. When I go home, there's always time there's family time, but there's iRacing time. And it's gotta be, my wife knows I gotta get on there and I gotta get that out of my system. Cause if I don't, I'm gonna be a grump. Yeah, the Pro Race of Champions for me, um, it, it's sorta, of, you know, I circle it on my calendar cause it's a big deal to me. And I, it's something I wanna make sure that I'm around when the, when the announcement's made of when it is and you get the invite. It's, to me, it's sorta of like getting invited to the, the Prelude to the Dream, which is a, a race I've raced with Tony Stewart and, and all those guys for several years, it's just something I look forward to. You get to kind of test yourself with some of the best drivers in the world. And I know a lot of them spend a lot more time than I do on it. I know a lot of them probably have better setups than I do. But it's still the fact that I'm racing with some of the best racers and from different types of, of, of auto racing. And the biggest thing is guys always give me crap when we're in there jokingly, because it's a tight fit fraternity of, of race car drivers. You know, No matter what you drive, it's still a fraternity. But I'm always getting jabbed, no matter what kind of racing I go do. Uh, the only thing I know how to do is go straight. So it's funny how um, you know I get in there, but man, it's like I tell the family, don't bug me. This, this is serious. You can't come ask me questions on it. I can't pause it. And um, you know, I, I get ready for this thing. It's like a serious race for me. So I had a pretty good time. I did. I just try to finish. I know I'm not going to win, but um, I still have a blast. And just uh, it's it's it's. It's really funny because you'll find yourself 
after the race is like, whoo, like you're kind of shaking, like man, you know, or maybe in the middle of a caution or something, and you're like, ah, so it, it gets exciting. Uh, yeah, as soon as last year's Pro Race of Champions is over, I'm already ready for next year. <laughs> you know, uh, I guess I need to upgrade something, and I, I think it's starting to be, I need to upgrade my time on iRacing because I found myself on it for qualifying thinking, man, that was a great lap, and then looking on the list, I'm like mid-pack. I'm like, God, what do I gotta do to pick it up? But that's motorsport, that's auto racing, that's how you dig to find those little fractions of a second here or there. And uh, it's such a cool deal because I got a lot of friends and family and a lot of fans that tune in to watch it. And it's sort of like they're watching a race. They see me in my Napa truck or car or whatever I'm racing on there. And they're able to watch their other favorite racers. And it's just a lot of fun. Well, advice for anybody new to iRacing is uh, don't overextend yourself. You don't, really, don't need anything fancy, but make sure you get good equipment. And uh, you're not going to be the best, and you're not going to get the best license right off the bat. It's all about the journey. And like anything else, you, you work your way up, and that's the funnest part of having to do good in races, not make mistakes, don't wreck people, and do your best. And that's the way you're going to progress, just like you would in real life. You're not going to go out there and jump in a Williams Formula One car as a rookie driver. Um, because, let's face it, you got to be very good to race some of these cars at that level. And that's what iRacing is all about. It's about making yourself better, working your way up from a car to a better car, making your lap times better, um, and most importantly, keeping your reputation good as you would in real life. If you go to race anything, I don't care if it's a club or you're a NASCAR driver or you're a Formula One driver, um, you you want to be looked at by your peers um, and you want the respect. And if you race like an idiot on iRacing like you would in a, a regular series in a car, you're probably going to get kicked, get kicked, either kicked out or somebody's going to have a, a, a bad feeling about you. So just take your time and, and do things the right way. do is as soon as it comes back, they all dive into it. Guy goes underneath, two guys on the side, guy on top taking the supercharger off, guy back here taking all the clutch apart, actually two guys taking the clutch apart. And what happens is, the first thing they do is the guy at the bottom end will get the pan off while they're working. And the first thing he'll do is he'll pull one main cap off, usually the back of the rear main, pull it down and look if it's straight or the crankshaft is something wrong or something burnt. Right away he'll say, no, you know, he'll tell them something, but basically the block and the crank are coming out. The whole thing's coming out. So they'll get another motor we got ready out and be ready. If everything's good, just say everything's good, then when they take it all apart, these heads come off, supercharger goes over, he'll re strip the inside of the supercharger. There's Tylon or a Teflon strips. They'll pull the old ones out, put new ones in so it's got a good seal again. And he's already got heads with the, with the headers on them already and they're ready to go. I'll show you those in a second. So basically, if the block and the crank are good, it stays in. They actually can do a turnaround quicker if they put a whole new motor in. They, they'll do it 35 minutes and have brand new everything ready to fire up again. So it just depends on the crank and the block right off the bat. If the block and the crank and the block are good, it'll stay. The heads and everything go in, they get serviced to run again maybe the next day or two days or the next week if they didn't get hurt or burnt. Or heads, you do, hopefully everything's all right. We've got nine motors ready to run. Wait, so um, what I'll do during the burnout, they have to pump on halfway. And then when I roll up the stage, they drop the body down and do all my stuff. And I like the first three stage, both drivers do that. That means you're ready. I'll pull the pump all the way on, and you'll hear the RPM drop a little bit up there. And then when we roll in to light the stage light, what I do is I let my foot pull pump on, let my foot off the clutch, I'll count 1,001, 1,002, then I let my foot all the way off the clutch, and because it's a centrifugal clutch, I can hold the car sitting there at idle with the brake, and then I'll, I'll just let the brake off and just let it ease in, because you only got to roll about eight inches. Yeah, I take my foot completely off and I set it back here, and 
because it's like a mini bike when you're a kid, when it's a triple clutch, it slowly applies clutch. It's basically what it is, except it's a five disc clutch in here. And uh, so I'll let my foot off, hold the car with the brake, that's when you really hear the RPM drop. You'll hear it the second time is when my foot comes off the clutch. And then I inch it forward with the brake. As soon as the stage light comes on for both drivers, the flash or the yellow and green comes down. We basically just hit the throttle as quick as you can and you let go of the handbrake all at the same time. It just, it's your gas, pedal, and your handbrake. At the same time, it's your foot down, hand off the brake. And you just let the brake go. It'll tear the brake out of your hand anyway. If you don't let go, and it'll pull right out. So, right. But, but you try to do that at the same time. And then you hang on. levers you'll see up here, they're actually on the body, and when the body drops down, this tend work is right here. So when I go down and I'll, I'll be still, I'll be a football field away when I see the finish line, and I'll, and I'll reach my hand over without looking, I just know where it's at, I'll reach my hand over with about a football field away, and I'll push the lever forward, because by the time I do that I'm there already. And when I hit that lever, that cable pops out the back, the spring comes out the parachute and pulls the parachute out. So by the time I've done that, I'm already at the finish line. Because you're going 320 miles an hour. You're covering ground pretty quick. There's a button underneath that starts all the timers. And the timers depict how quick that clutch locks up. Because they want to apply clutch as you get going. You can't give it all 10,000 at the hit of the throttle. So it might see... It's got some weights that bolt on it, and it might see 40% of that weight from here to that truck. And then a second into the run, he's got a timer, says, okay, I'm gonna move the throttle bearing another half an inch, and then it's gonna have 70% of the clutch. And if it's a good track, it'll hold. If it's too much too soon, you'll see him smoke the tires. These are the big timers he makes changes with. And then, also, what it does is he's, he's got a little box. I'll show you the box, but it's called a, it's an ignition map, basically is what it is. It can't do anything live on the car. It's only data acquisition. So when they come back, I'll show you up there the, the runs on a computer they can look at, and they change it again for the next run. They have pagers and stuff that they'll carry up the starting line. They'll tell them minute, minute to minute, temperature change, if it drops one degree. And they don't even measure humidity. They measure water grains in the air. They actually can tell water grains change like that. Uh, right up to the time we run. It's got a, a pager that will go off and they can look at it. And basically all these trailers have, a, we have our systems, our weather systems that will update it. And every trailer you'll see on the back sticking up has one and it will send an update to their pager. Everything's based on track temperature basically. And how the track is initially, but really like this morning, I mean we knew we were going to run late, but at one point today the track temp is 170 degrees. So you know it's going to be slippery, the sun's been beating on the rubber down there, and it's going to be a little gooey. So it's not ideal. Tonight when the weather cools off, I mean, it's going to be as good as it's going to get. It's going to be all right. Then you can, you can look in your records and go, I'm going to do I'm through everything I can and keep it a hold. So tonight's going to be incredible. But uh, really as the weekend goes on, it just depends on the weather and how much sun's on the track and what does the track and that, that, Track temperature rising is it's a good cruise here so you can adapt and go, okay, it's getting hot. Track temperature is 125. By the time we run, it might be 130. I better take some clutch weight off. And maybe you put another couple of ignition timing maps, one super, super mellow. They might put in at the last minute. Then he preset in that box and he plugs it in and downloads it. And then then he can put that in at the last second and say, okay, I know it's going to make it because everything's back down a lot. Like I was telling you guys, it can't do anything during the run, but he can download it, look at it, make a, I don't want to say a guess for the next run. It's easy to say a guess, but an educated guess on what the track temp might be and then kind of go from there. But, you know, it's got the drive shaft down here, and at any point he can click the cursor and it'll tell him what the uh, drive shaft speed is. It's got RPM up here, the other green one, and you can see where the clutch comes together there. The way they punch it into that small box looks sort of like that and they can put a few of them in there that they preset here when they say, okay, I'm gonna put a few, name them, whatever I want to name them, put them in there and then kind of the last minute put whatever one I want to put in, but it, it sort of looks like that works every time. It's 
it's about um, the clutch and the engine trying to get together because we really govern how these cars run with the amount of clutch that we apply and when we don't apply a lot of clutch if you keep the timing coming at it it wants the engine wants to run away from the drive shaft and it makes the clutch hot and then it welds it together and it wants to spin the tires see you see how the timing goes flat so it heats the clutch up and then it wants to spin the tires so the way we fix that was to put that check in the, in the timing and as you can see by the green top one how smooth it is when it comes together and goes on or down right like I said we really govern this thing with the amount of clutch and it'll actually run out of clutch out there to where it doesn't have enough to physically make the engine and the, and the drive shaft yeah, get right. one to one and that was that run there you'll see they came together like you said and that's the tires going up and spinning all the way through the finish line well it was cool because they came back and I go we need to fix that we got to do this mm -hmm. and this and this well that's the very next run I went out and went ah. and when I got back I told them oh it was nice it came together nice didn't spin but I guess that one of the tricks is if, if the crew chief can get them to come together one to one without losing traction the soonest on a run sure. is going to probably sense. run better like you can see this is all the data Every one of these little buttons is something they can look at from one of the floors. Clutch pressure, cylinder temperature. Yeah. As much as they want to put up there, they probably work that. We had a, used to have a, like this thing is about 20 foot long. And in the middle it had a, a simple uh, linear device that they would roll along and you could see the bumps. but. So if we know that there's a bump at 559 feet, I mean, really, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> right. Like last week in Bristol, we know on the left lane, there's a tunnel that goes underneath from the one side to the other, and the, the whole track is settled over that tunnel. Well, that one, we know in the left lane, it'll jump both front wheels off the ground. Well, you know that you have to be careful going over that spot. This means that the wheels are off the ground. Off the ground. That's, that's oh. both front wheels are off the ground. So the next time we ran in the left lane, we we did calm the clutch down. We just slowed the clutch application through there for two or three tenths of a second, and then we let it go again. And there are good runs in the left lane, but it's just something that is there, and it, and it kind of will, you know, when these cars, when they're moving either side to side or back to front, they're upset, and they don't like it, and that's when they're most prone to smoke the tires. They need to be firm, planted, smooth. But you hit these bumps, what goes up, you know, when it comes down, it tries to lift the back end up, and then we lose traction. See, that don't look like much right there, but that's about 40 feet. The front wheels are off the ground for about 40 feet. And sometimes it'll do that. If you're really applying the clutch hard, it'll pick the front end up. But there's no, you know, you go over a bump, you go over something, it launches you, and then the rear tires have to go. You know, so there's a lot of times where we'll really haul ass through the middle, and it'll go out there and pick the front end up. Remember when we tested this year in West Palm? Yeah. See, so that's the temperature of the tire. Oh, yeah. It does that. See how it kind of chops the tire temperature? So it upsets the back of the car.